Welcome to End of Life University on YouTube. Today I'm sharing with you a video of a conversation I had with Lisa Paul and Lori Lo Cicero. They are the creators of the Death Deck, and we're going to talk all about the Death Deck conversation game and the importance of having conversations about death. So this is a really fun interview and I'm looking forward to sharing it with you. Be sure to subscribe to this channel down below. Also subscribe or follow the podcast wherever you happen to listen and leave a rating and review. And if you'd like to support the podcast and the channel financially, you can go to eoluniversity.com slash support and find out about three different ways you can offer support to keep us on the air. So let's go with my conversation with Lisa and Lori. Today, I'm so happy to welcome back my friends and my return guests to the podcast, Lisa Paul and Lori Lo Cicero. Together, they're the creators of the Death Deck, and we're going to talk about that today for anyone out there who hasn't yet heard of the Death Deck. Lisa is a hospice social worker and ER crisis interventionist. Lori is a writer, entrepreneur, and eternal optimist. And I'm so glad that you're both here with me today so welcome thank you it's good to be here and see you again Karen yeah definitely I, I was looking back and our last recording for the podcast was in 2019 in the summer and I think was that fairly recently after the death deck came out yeah about yeah about nine months so it was in our first year we and were still finding our way and we're so incredibly honored to be on your podcast it was a huge thing for us that we were very happy to do it was that. a big deal back then but look at you guys you've done so many <laughs> things now and you've been you you're all over the place <laughs> with the death deck so and also right now 2019 seems like that was like eons ago it's hard to even remember all the way back then <laughs> It sure does. The before COVID times, right? Yeah, yeah. It does feel like a very long time ago. Definitely. We're, we're glad to be back. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'm excited to talk about the death deck and then any the new things that you're doing as well. So Lori, for any listeners who aren't familiar with the death deck, maybe you could just tell them what it is and describe also how the two of you came together from your different walks of life to come up with this idea for the death deck. Yeah, so for those who aren't familiar with the death deck, it is a card game and also a conversation tool. Uh, it is 112 cards, uh, a bulk of them, 80 of them are multiple choice and the remainder are open ended. It can be played in a number of different ways. Uh, one game way it was designed to be for game night. So an alternative to some of the other talking games uh, with family or friends, uh, it can be competitive. You can score points if you guess each other's answers, if you pair up, uh, or you can also just play it without scoring points. Uh, we have those competitive ones out there that like that and some who don't wanna even bother with the point scoring system. So. You can play it that way. You could also just pull cards and round robin and answer questions. And another way that it can be used is a conversation tool. We found that it's been very valuable in hospice, hospital, end of life settings for people to use the cards as conversation starters, um, since they are, again, that multiple choice element where you don't necessarily get put on the spot to answer the question, but you can line up with an answer and and answer it. Uh, how it came to be? Uh, well, I was put in the position of having to call in hospice when my husband uh, had been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and we realized that we uh, were at the very end. Uh, so for the last two weeks of his life, um, I did call in home hospice and that's where I met Lisa. She was the hospice social worker that came to our house and helped guide us through uh, the, the end. And it was an eye-opening experience. It was absolutely chaotic and horrific for me since I had no idea what anything was happening at the time. I, did, I had no clue what hospice was and, and what it meant. And now, of course, want you know everyone to call it in earlier because we called it in so late, and I just I know the value of bringing it in early now. But that's where we met. Lisa also provided the bereavement support for long after, and from that bereavement support, we had these incredible conversations about 
you know, from my personal experience, how I felt um, unprepared and, and didn't know why. And from Lisa's professional experience, she sees people like me every single day that go through this. So from that, we decided we need to do something about this. So, you know, what can we do to help people be better, better prepared? What can we do to start these conversations earlier? And we came up with this idea for a game that had a little bit of humor that could be an icebreaker to help people start getting familiar with this topic and being better prepared. And I'm so glad you emphasize that it does have humor and that's one of I think one of the benefits of having multiple choice questions because sometimes the answers are are a little bit humorous but they're always thought provoking and uh, and I really like that aspect and from what I've seen that's pretty unique amongst the games that are out there for in, for encouraging conversations about death. Yeah, it's not easy but it's necessary. <laughs> yeah. And um, I love that the two of you you've come to Together from different realms in a sense, but it's so nice that you have the perspective of um, Lori as an, a person experiencing death, a family member, a loved one, and Lisa with pr that professional experience. So between the two of you, you bring together just the right wisdom and knowledge to create this. And I wanted to ask you, Lisa, about why do you feel it's important, especially maybe right now, that we have conversations about death? Because actually, we still don't seem to be having very many of them in our society. I think it's gotten better, though, since maybe even since the last time we did a podcast in 2019. But it's still so important, and we need to keep emphasizing it. Mm -hmm. Well, the, to me, it it's... I mean, I, I can list so many reasons why this topic is so important. Um, I, I'm, you know, in my work as a hospice social worker, um, even with hospice patients who, you know, they come onto hospice, they, they've been given a diagnosis of six months or less, and um, the family is also aware and they've agreed for hospice services, and yet there's often still a hesitation to actually talk about the fact that this person is dying. And it's, it's um, to me, I, I feel some sadness around those situations because um, there's a lot of both richness in confronting our mortality in these conversations that come from it. Um, it also, it tends to leave the, the patient themselves or the person who's seriously ill feeling a little alone in the process if, if those around you aren't willing to talk about it. And sometimes there's a feeling of let's just keep things upbeat. Let's keep things positive. Mom's having a good day. Why do you want to talk about this? Um, which, which I understand. And yet, um, if, if that continues, it may be the next time I go that then the, then the conversation is, well, we just need to manage our pain. And so that's what we're focused on. And there's always something to focus on that isn't about really what's happening. And so um, to me, I think that if, if, we, if we start these conversations in normal day-to-day -day life, when we aren't in the midst of a medical crisis, we're not our family member or ourselves doesn't have a serious illness, then, then we, we practice, we get more comfortable with this topic. We start these conversations. We've, we have a place to return to um, in the conversation later, if, when we need it. I was going to say if, but we all know, you know, we're all going to die and each of our family members are going to die at some point. And so um, I really encourage people to, to begin in, you know, today's today um, to, to start these conversations. And, and there's so many great tools now. Um, you know, we're, we're one of them that can help stimulate these conversations. Um, there's a, a wealth of amazing podcasts out there like yours. Um, Anderson Cooper just launched a new podcast that really focuses on grief, but it's, it's honing into all of the important moments of, of conversation prior to a death. Um, 
And relatedly, um, I think people's grief experience tends to be just a little softer, a little easier when there are these conversations ahead of time. And when people feel like, I know that I, one, I, I did what I needed to do for my family member. And secondly, you know, I, I honored their wishes because I knew what those wishes were. And I, and I feel good about that. I may have lots of other feelings and I may even have some regrets about times that I was grumpy with them and, and whatever may come up, but there isn't the sense of, I'm wondering if I did the right thing. I'm wondering if I really honored their wishes. Um, and and that, that complicates our grief experience. Um, yeah, so very true. And it, I think it's every sector of our society is resistant to talking about death, but it's very tragic that medicine, as you know, from being part of it, really fosters that as well, because medical doctors and nurses in general outside of hospice don't talk about death and dying either. And so, so that's why really people have to initiate these conversations on their own. It's not going to happen most likely at the doctor's office. No one else is going to bring it up. And um, I don't know if you have anything to chime in on here, Lori, about when you went through this process, if you and your husband had had conversations about death and dying in advance at all, or, or was it just, you mentioned that it was something completely new to you, but had you been able to talk about it? beforehand? Yeah, you know, the one time we started talking about it was when we decided we were going to start a family. And we felt like we needed to be prepared. So we met with a financial planner. And we, you know, did our advanced care directives. And we took out life insurance policies. And we felt like that was it. We're prepared. We've done it. You know, we can check that box. But what I realized after he died was that was the only conversation that we had that was six years prior to all of this happening. And we pretty much just filled out the boilerplate paperwork and signed our names and got through it as quickly as possible. It's like, yeah, you cover me, I cover you. And it just, it was the very basics. And at least we had that. I'm very thankful that we had that conversation, we had that. But once he got his diagnosis of a stage four cancer, you know, then the topic was completely off the table. I mean, that was the hope crusher. We were not going to talk about it at that time because it was not going to happen. And, you know, I think that's very common and very foolish as well, because that's when we should have started talking about it as well. And we, and we didn't, we didn't talk about it until a couple months prior to his death when I realized that this was probably going to be the outcome. And there were things I needed to know. So from that, we had a conversation, a very brief conversation. I got basic ideas down as to what he wanted for his death, but that was, that was it. So we did not have the conversations and we really should have had them prior to that diagnosis. If you had had something like the death deck available, do you think that would have helped you get the conversation started? Because because I just want to talk to people about how having a tool like the death deck can make a difference. Oh, 100 percent. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of it we just didn't know we needed to know. There were things that came up that you know, were I was blindsided by. It was like, well, well, wait, what do you mean he's going to lose the ability to, to speak and communicate at the end. That just completely took me off guard. And so then that, com that completely took conversations off the table. So, yeah, I mean, and Lisa and I say this a lot, it's, it's, you know, it's the game that, you know, that I wish that Joe and I could have played because that would have given us the tools, that would have given us the comfort, that would have given us the ideas to, to start. We talked all the time about everything. We, we worked together. We were together all the time having conversations, except this one, because this is the one that no one has. So, Because the game really covers a lot of territory. <laughs> I mean, it, the questions ask about all sorts of things. I mean, as I can recall, like, what, what kind of music do you want at your funeral? Or, or a lot of things about your attitudes and ideas about aspects around death and dying, but maybe the two of you could just share a few of the questions from the game to give an example of that. 
Yeah, you know, we, we also created the game, the death deck to try to, um, well, within each question, within the questions, we provide some education. Um, so helping people to understand that these are, these are available options for you, such as, you know, different dispositions. There's not just cremation and burial anymore. You, there is human composting. Um, and so, you know, we have questions that are kind of ex that explore that you can have um, jewelry made of cremated remains. Is that something that you would consider wearing? And so each of the questions helps give a prompt to the, um, to, you know, to the people playing that these are these are available um, options out there and and can spur people to either take action or at least talk about it with their family and say, um, you know, you 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 can you can ask for me to wear a necklace of your remains, mom, but I'm not going to do it or we you know whatever their response mm -hmm. is because um, there's a lot within the death space and end of life space that that people just don't know when they're not involved in it. And so we wanted to also bring to you know everyday people that these are these are options now. Um, there's we have questions about um, you know specifically the dying process. How much you know uh, when you're dying, should your families err on the side of more medication or less? You know what's important to you in that moment. Um, we have questions about advanced directives and um, whether you trust doctors to make decisions for you, um, who you want to make decisions for you. Uh, so we cover a lot of advanced care planning as well as um, uh, thoughts and beliefs. Um, we talk about afterlife and people's beliefs on that as well as signs from beyond, which um, is, is one of Lori's favorite topics that I always love hearing. Um, Joe, Joe has so many ways that he has um, let us know that he encourages the work that we're doing and uh, remains present in, in Lori and the kids' lives. So, but these are, the, these are some of our, the topics that we cover that, um, that we try to educate as well as uh, promote conversations and, and thoughts. Um, and I really love that because even if someone's playing the game kind of reluctantly because the family decided to, they can, as you said, it doesn't put them on the spot too much because they can just choose an answer like, oh, C, B, <laughs> even if it's something they've never thought about before. But what you're doing is planting seeds for that person to say, I had no idea how to answer that question and later on and to go back like, I I kind of need to know more about that. I, I've never thought about that before. I, so I think there's, it's so brilliant. But now that you brought this up, I just, Lori, are there any signs from beyond <laughs> that you want to share? Because I'm really fascinated to learn about that too. If Sorry, I, we didn't plan to talk about that. But, but since Lisa mentioned it, uh, signs from Joe that you're on the right track. Yeah, I mean, there are so many, aren't there, Lisa? <laughs> <laughs> and he always has made his presence very well known in very specific situations. And, and I love that. And at first, you know, there were the things that were, oh, yeah, no, that's a coincidence. Or, oh, yeah, no, there's a lot of people named Joe. But, I mean, it would just come in just the exact right moments. Um, one of my favorites, which was, it was actually a while ago, but the one I love to tell is, you know, Joe was so passionate about school and the kids and he was you know he was the father that was on the committees and you know he just he loved that and even the his final year when he was you know dealing with his cancer he was still determined to walk our son to school and back every day that he could so um, after he passed uh, there was a, a private school that we were trying to get our son into and we finally did after Joe had died and on the first day of that orientation, you know, I'm in the back of the room just having all the feels of like, oh, he should be here and I'm holding back tears and it's like, oh, I know how much he would love this and it was just so special and but I couldn't wait to run out of there because I was, you know, <laughs> the sobbing mother in the back of the room, but I held it together. I walked out to my car and as I got to my car, I looked down and someone had dropped a name tag 
and it was right at the foot of my car and the name tag said Joe. So oh. to me, <laughs> to me, that was a very specific moment of a Joe yeah. and it was like, I'm here, I'm here. So. Oh, a, a touch from Joe just when you needed it at that moment. That's very sweet to hear. Well, um, you mentioned your children and I wanted to ask about, about that too, about talking to children about death and dying and teaching them. And do you recommend the death deck to be used with children, Lisa? And, um, yeah, you know, um, so we have a, an age 13 on it mostly because we, we really view it as something, um, that, most likely younger kids aren't going to get that interested in. Um, uh, but what I'll say is that my, um, but all the questions could be asked to, to children and teens, um, the ones that, that we have. Um, my son is now almost 14 and he's actually, he's played the game um, and pulled questions to his friends when they come over since fourth or fifth fifth grade I guess mm. um, and and so which is really fun for me to think about this group of you know teenage boys walking around having some conversations about death and um, and talking about it and it's fascinating to hear their perspective Lori and I have had the pleasure of, of um, uh, actually, presenting in a couple of high schools over Zoom and um, in college. And, you know, it's such a ripe age of, of exploration of people's beliefs and opinions. And, and you know, teenagers love to give their opinions on topics. So um, to me, you know, it, it, it goes back to the idea of if we can get comfortable with this topic, you know, um, then it's, we may not have grown up with parents that were able and willing and had the tools to speak um, openly about death and dying. But if, but if we are able to increase our comfort level and begin to talk to our kids um, through everyday conversations, you know, there's, there's topics of when a, um, a celebrity dies that um, gives an opportunity to talk about you know, their thoughts and feelings on it, um, you know, an easy way to kind of talk as well as about, um, you know, the idea of celebration of life or what, what they think about that, what's important to them that they would want celebrated. Um, you know, when, when we have oftentimes, if, Oftentimes, a um, kid's first death experience is with a pet or a grandparent. That is often. Um, unfortunately, some kids lose a parent early um, or other close family members, but often it's a grandparent or a pet. And how we respond in those moments to our kids, is, it's really important, you know, including them in uh, the process and understanding that they have their own grief. Um, as well as kind of gently normalizing that death is a part of life. And, and while it can feel sad and scary at times, it's, it's also, if we leave, live, we must die. And that is, that is how the world and life works. And so, um, and if you have religious beliefs, it's an opportunity to talk about those too. You know, I think, I think oftentimes in our religious conversations, we just, we focus on what's going to happen after, but not the death, not the death conversation and not, you know, but it, but it, it's also opportunities to talk about how we're living our lives, right? And the legacy that we're creating as adults and the legacy that our kids are creating as, as humans and um, family members. And, and, and again, just to go back, if our kids can start having these conversations and at least become more comfortable with it, just think about, you know, their grief experiences and how they might be able to, um, how prepared they might be able to be to, uh, for their own death, you know, taking, like Lori said, taking out life insurance, doing advanced directives, 
Um, everybody at age 18 needs an advanced directive. Parents don't legally have the right uh, to make decisions for adult children um, necessarily, right? It's, it's, it, it can get very sticky if there's not an advanced directive in place. So um, we encourage people to talk early with their kids and um, and the duck deck is one tool. I, um, Lori and I always talk about stacking the deck so that, um, you know, making sure that the questions that you think is best for the person you're going to play with and um, the setting that you're in. So people who are working in advanced um, care planning are pulling questions that relate to advanced care planning. People who are playing in a party game are pulling usually more softer questions and more just exploration of thoughts, right? And then um, with our kids, questions that, that talk about, um, we have some questions about grief, uh, what, what scent reminds you of someone that died? Um, that's, I, I like to ask my, my son and his, his friends that question because uh, it, it relates to who they lost and what they um, what they can relate to. Oh, I remember my grandma. She always smelled like licorice and, she, you know, those sorts of things. So um, we are one tool to help kids become more comfortable with this topic as well as adults. Mm. I love that. And I agree that it's so important. And, and I think there are many opportunities in our children's lives when they do encounter death, as you said, grandparents or pets that sometimes just get shoved aside by parents who aren't comfortable talking about it, but it's such a wonderful opportunity to sit down and, and really talk through the emotions and the pain of grief and the cycle of life and death and why we all need to be prepared for that. I think that COVID kind of woke a lot of us up, but children as well, because children were hearing a lot more about death than they may have and also becoming aware of people in their in their lives who died because of COVID. So I'm, I was curious to know if you saw any changes or any increased usage of the death deck during the pandemic or... Yeah, it was a little tricky because we do have an element of humor to our game, as we discussed earlier. So, and that's often part of our marketing. So to be utilizing that uh, was not necessarily appropriate. And we felt like that, um, that getting new, new people involved and in, in playing the game at that time, it was, it was kind of like what we're talking about. It's, you know, we waited until the moment. And when COVID hit, it was the moment. And then it became even more uncomfortable to talk about death. But once I think the pandemic continued and we, we, we did start seeing more deaths, we did start getting more comfortable talking about it, uh, then we feel like that's when we started to see more people playing and then, you know, people, more people purchasing. But Lisa, do you have anything? Yeah, like yeah, Lori and I had some, I mean, you know, when, when COVID first hit um, it, and the world kind of shut down, um, we, we did feel reluctant to be promoting um, the death deck at that time because it, it felt scary and we felt we were scared. We, you know, we were kind of in it as well. And so, um, but I think Lori summarized it well. Once, once COVID continued and we, I mean, I kind of hate the phrase, but we got used to that new normal and we, we, we adapted somewhat. Um, uh, I mean, there's been, there's been a lot of new end of life um, products that have emerged during COVID um, because I think a lot of people began to, to really understand, um, well, we had so many, so many deaths, first of all, right? With all of those deaths, you have all of these grievers and you have all of these people who are now trying to navigate, you know, what to do after someone dies. And so now there's more tools 
to help with um, with that and how to help people be more prepared before someone dies because because COVID deaths were you can be healthy and you can be dead in two weeks and that is new to how we look at health in our country and so um, I think that that became COVID and has increased, I think, a general public awareness of, of death and dying and grief. And, um, and there's been, like I said, there's been some amazing tools and, and new people coming to uh, this movement of, of helping people be more prepared and helping people deal with death and dying. Um, and yeah, and it does seem uh, now we are dealing with a lot of grievers, as you mentioned, a lot of people, the initial shock and trauma of COVID is past us, but now we have so many people still recovering and dealing with grief. And I'm curious to know if you've heard of people like using it to, as a way of addressing their grief, or if you've heard any like creative or unique ways people are using the death deck. Yeah, I don't know so much about using it for grief, which is uh, actually one of the new decks that we uh, will be working on because we know that there's a need for it. You know, a lot of the questions, I mean, there are some in here that, that can be pulled and, and can be used, but we feel like that in and of itself is worthy of, of questions to help both the person grieving and those around them that have no clue how to help them. And I think that's really an important part of it is it's not just, it is helping the griever sort of understand and normalize what they're going through, that it's, it's, it is a normal process, but also, you know, how do you help your friend who's lost a husband? I think that's, that's equally important to, to, to open that up in society as well, because a lot of people just, they don't know, so they run away and, and it's, it's such a shame, but it's, it, it's just how we, we cope. Um, uh, as for creative ways that people are using the death deck, um, we've covered a lot of them, I think, in our conversation. Um, financial planners who are trying to get people to, to start to talk about it, like my situation, in, in those key moments, you know, even people just getting married and starting to, to bring together their lives. I mean, that's a, a very important time to start talking about these things. I mean, people have been using them in, in death cafes, uh, both online and now in person, which is wonderful. We love uh, getting feedback from people. Oh, yeah, we used your game in the cafe and it helped us, you know, to, to start these conversations and we had a really good time. Uh, death doulas have become huge advocates, which we love, and uh, adding them to their toolkits. Uh, it's not always appropriate to use all the cards, as we know, but uh, doulas have found a way to pull the cards and read the room and find the people that, you know, they know would it would be helpful for and they would be open to having those conversations in the moment. Um, let's see, other creative ways, people have been starting meetings and opening up meetings rather than the, the traditional boring, okay, we're gonna start our meeting now. You know, let's let's start a little differently. And and I've seen people, you know, let's let's talk about this card. And they'll start with a card and allow people to either share or listen. And um, unfortunately for them, sometimes that takes over the meeting because it does <laughs> spark these conversations where, oh, there it's an open door. Okay, let's talk about it. So um, and I love being part of those too, because I always find something unique and unusual that I haven't heard a way someone has answered the question, their perspective, the way someone interprets the question as we've written it. I've had people, you know, I go, oh, well, we didn't necessarily write it with that intention, but you've pulled out a whole new way to, you know, sort of talk about the, that topic in general. So, you know, we've, we've had a lot of different people, you know, share these things and we, we love hearing about the, the different creative ways that people have, have found and how they, they use them. I know we've, we've brought them to bars and, you know, set them out <laughs> in an unlikely, you know, situation you would think, but, you know, people are loosening up and some of the lighter questions and, you know, it just, it, it, these, these conversations that come out of it are just incredible. 
So it, it shows what a need there is. Like people have this pent up need to be able to talk about it. And I'm sure as many times as the two of you have played the game, it's never the same twice. It's always something different and something new, which um, which make does make it kind of something fun that you can even I mean keep using over and over again, even in your family. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I oh sorry, Larry. Oh, I was gonna say even my answers aren't the same sometimes yeah. twice. <laughs> yeah. You know, the yeah. more I learn and the more I think about it, and my spirituality grows. It's like you know what I actually. I think a little differently now. So it's even your own personal answers may change. That was going to be part of my comment. It's oh. been really fun to play with Lori uh, repeatedly over the years because, um, you know, we know each other pretty well and how we're going to answer these questions since we've answered them before. But, but we surprise each other now with our answers sometimes and say, um, well, you know, I've kind of, yeah, I've shifted a little bit on that. And this is how I'm feeling now. And um, I've also been using the death deck with um, my social work interns. So that's been really fun as a tool um, and also our volunteers, our hospice volunteers. And, and both of those applications are really, again, trying to get people more comfortable. If you're going to be working with death and dying and with patients and families in that capacity, then you you really do need to understand your own experience with that, your own thoughts and feelings. And, um, and so it's also one of the things that um, I, I, I continue to be surprised that I didn't think about this aspect as a social worker before we made the game, but um, the richness of the conversations and the intensity of the topic means that when you play this game with people, the connections that you have become so much stronger because you're talking about real things. You're talking about um, important value-driven um, concepts that you aren't normally sharing with people in your day-to-day -day life. You know, we have all these conversations in our day-to-day -day life. Oh, what'd you have for lunch? Oh, what about this? What'd you watch on TV? Surfacey level stuff, which is fun. And, you know, we need all of that too. But when you have conversations like this um, with strangers or people you know well, um, it, it, it furthers that connection. And that's been a really beautiful, unexpected bonus of, of creating the duck deck. When you mentioned using it with your interns, that made me think my daughter is in nursing school right now. And I was just thinking, wow, that would be a perfect place for teachers. You know, I mean, of course, they have a lot to teach in a short amount of time, but just to draw a card and introduce some of the questions um, during during the day in each class or something, because, of course, nurses and nursing students, well, for any students in the medical, any aspect of medicine could really benefit from just, just from thinking about these questions and thinking about how they might answer it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know, um, I know, Karen, you and I have talked quite a bit about the, the topic of the medical profession, right, the medical field and how we um, because overall the medical model is curative and, and the focus is cure and treatment, there is so little attention given to the fact that everyone's going to die regardless of our medical <laughs> interventions, you know, eventually they will. And, um, and as we know, you know, so much money is spent uh, through Medicare on the final year of someone's life as they keep going back to the hospital and we keep having all of, you know, they keep sending them back home and back to the hospital when another crisis happens. And, um, you know, the more we can have our, our newly trained uh, medical professionals to, to just have a wider perspective of the quality of life that patients um, are experiencing so that they can have the courage to, to gently begin a conversation with 
with the family. Um, and Lori and I talk about, you know, one of our taglines has been uh, pray, uh, play on brave souls. Because mm. there's, there's courage that's needed, you know, to, to have these conversations sometimes because it's rare and people aren't talking about it because we kind of have this that's morbid and dark and if if you talk about it it's going to happen there's just a lot of reasons that people don't um, bring it up but but if you have a little bit of courage you can you can start these conversations and and make a difference so maybe maybe your daughter needs a deck yeah, I hadn't thought of that before. But she actually told me she said, I have half the students and teachers in my class listening to your podcast now. And so I said, well, that's a, that's a good start. But actually, I mean, you can listen in to all of this interesting information. But the game is really fun, because it makes you think about yourself and your own choices. And that that is that's where people need to go that's where they need to be is thinking about their own lives not just in general learning information that in their heads they imagine will only affect someone else and then the game reminds them this is about you and your life and your choices yeah and just to add on that too with the with the doctors and nurses and whatnot i i think it it can kind of go both ways too i think if families are playing and have questions and are comfortable and are approaching the doctors, then I feel like the doctors would be more willing to have more of these conversations. I personally feel from my experiences is they were playing upon how we were handling or asking about the situation. And I feel like if, if more families would, you know, bring this up more, actively ask questions more, I think that there would be more discussion that way as well. So again, being your, your own best advocate, but approaching, you know, the medical field. Cause I think mm. there's a, there's a missing handoff sometimes too, where, you know, once it goes from that general practitioner to hospice or palliative care, I mean, it's just, wait, who's having the conversation? And it's, it's not a smooth transition sometimes. It's just, okay, now you're in it. But I think if, if families had these conversations more, they would know more what to ask and what to anticipate and then be able to uh, make better decisions on their own health care and end of life. And ideally, I would love to see if all physicians and healthcare providers were trained to have conversations very early, like you described before, Lisa, before someone is sick, before they're in a place of need, to just normalize it and say, hey, I recommend to all my patients, you should think about this. You should think, think about this and plan ahead and have some idea of how you want things to go because you might need that information someday. That would change everything if they were simply people like I trained to be a family doctor. So seeing people for all kinds of general medical issues, if everyone in my in my specialty could just ask their patients to think about it or talk about it, it would make such a difference. Well, um, Lisa, I know Lori mentioned that you're working on something new, like a new, maybe a new deck that's focusing on grief. But tell us what what what's out there that you're that you're working on and what's new in the death deck world. Yeah, so exciting things, Karen. So we we have our this is our mothership, right? The the death deck, the original. Um, like Lori said, it's 112 questions, and we designed this deck to be used um, in every situation. There are specific cards you can use from the deck. However, not every every card is appropriate for every situation. So what, what we found is that um, we really needed um, a deck that was specific to people with serious illness, people who are aging, um, that had just a little bit of a different tone, a little bit of a different um, look, so that hospice and palliative care um, some of our um, senior centers would feel more comfortable using it. Um, we, we stand behind using the word deck and the skull because we really are about normalizing conversations about death and dying and actually saying the word dead, death. Um, however, we recognize um, 
that that doesn't feel comfortable for everyone. And and because our game was designed to be played um, when you're not in a medical crisis, some of the questions are not super sensitive to hospice and palliative care, which again, you can remove them. But we wanted to create something that was just for hospice and palliative care and people with serious illness, aging, and it's our EOL deck. So the end of life deck, it has a little koala on it instead of a skull. So a little softer image and um, it's 55 questions or sorry, 53 questions. And it will um, also has multiple choice and open-ended. Uh, we have more of a two thirds, multiple choice, one third open-ended on this one. Um, and so in, in this deck, we are asking questions that are very, very specific to the dying process and people's preferences, um, as well as what they want to happen after. And so we have, you know, questions related to what type of atmosphere you want. Would you like a lot of visitors or minimal? Um, questions related to your spirituality and religious preferences. Do you want a, a a religious professional to come in um, when you're close to the end. What, looking at the five senses, we have a question for each of those. What do you want to hear? What do you want to see? Um, uh, and then really the goal being that people can have closer to the death that they are idealizing and many people don't know what that is yet because they don't know what to expect and so like the death deck we, the questions are provide education we talk about death doulas um, we talk about green disposition um, ideas um, and so really we're educating as well as as stimulating conversations and our goal is so that you know medical professionals have a tool to broach these topics um, with the patients and families. So, um, you know, we can have, you can just bring the deck in with you, um, especially our social workers and chaplains. They're typically the ones who are having these type of conversations um, along with the nurses, but, but really that's who I'm, um, who in that setting is predominantly having them. So, that's, that's what we're really excited about. We're, we're hoping to launch it just at the start of 2023. Um, and like Lori mentioned, we also have a grief deck in the works that we've been you know, jotting down all of our questions for that. And that deck is, the, the aim is to create it in a very similar fashion, multiple choice, open-ended, still have kind of a playful tone. Um, and the idea to, is to stimulate conversations about your grief with people close to you or other grievers. So um, to be used in uh, grief support groups, uh, individual grief counseling, as well as just everyday people wanting and needing to talk about their grief experience. Wow, I love that. I love that you've expanded upon your original brilliant idea, but over time you've seen ways it could be applied a little bit differently and, and you've evolved and grown with that. And, and I really like that you call it the EOL deck because in my mind, at least there, I consider like the end of life as the last stage of life, really the last stage of our development, this end of life stage, which can last for any number of months or even years sometimes but it's when we turn our attention to focusing on uh, on approaching death and so i think it's very appropriate to have a deck that really focuses on that time of life for people who are at that place and so i i, I really like what you're creating that's really amazing well and thank you karen and that just made me think about the other side of the the eol deck which is we were asking questions about people's legacy how they want to be remembered um 
things that they're proud of, um, you know, at that stage in life, it isn't just about planning for your death. It's, it's looking back on your life. It's, it's talking with your family about what's of most value to you that you hope that they continue to live on, um, that lives on after you're gone. And so, um, we have questions related to that as well to kind of, to to provide that balance it's it's life and death and people live right up until the moment they die and these you know we, we continue to to love and laugh and share um through our eol stage and i like that having the card deck lets people approach these questions just a little bit at a time um, because you know they could even look at a, a card every day or once a week you know choose a card and it lets them think about each question and each aspect of this process over time without feeling overwhelmed by all of the things they need to think about at once but it just it helps them parse that out a little bit to make it a little easier for them to do this kind of thinking ahead and 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 also looking back at the same time yeah and it also with the deck we're hoping you know we're looking for those brave souls because we know that you know it happens so often where the person dying says you know don't tell my family i'm dying and you know and the first you know the family is like oh don't tell them they're dying or you know, Lisa explains it much better, but you know, the, what I'm saying is, you know, there, the, no one wants to have the conversation, but both parties know that the person is dying. So, you know, to have a little something as a tool, an excuse, a conversation starter to let people know, hey, yeah, we know we're all on the same page with this. Let's talk about this. And here's some things we can talk about. That's really interesting. Well, um, I, gosh, I'm excited that you're, that you're still creating new things and coming up with new ideas to fill in the gaps where they're needed. And it just, I, I don't know, I had this memory come back to me when we were talking about humor a little bit that I remember my mom and her older brother, they were three years apart, but they were always very close, but their, their whole relationship revolved around joking with each other and teasing each other and humor between them. And as they got older, they started this discussion about um, who's going to die first. And they would argue back and forth about it. And my mom said, I'm going to make sure I die first because I want you to have to pay for my funeral. And then her brother would say, I'm not paying for your funeral. And she said, you'll have to, I'm going to get you to sign an agreement. And then they would, they would argue about it. But I actually later thought, that was uh, for their level for where they were that was actually kind of a healthy thing that they were able to have this ongoing little argument and here at the they actually died one day apart my mom did die first but her brother died the very next day he didn't have to pay for her funeral in the end but um but there was something just so sweet about that and for some reason they were able to have that little tiny ongoing conversation where they acknowledge the fact that one day they would each die and that alone made a made a really big difference for them they both went into hospice at the same time and they called each other <laughs> and said oh, i'm on hospice awful. now are you <laughs> like oh. i just went on today too and um so anyway there's just this sweetness whenever we can introduce these conversations and when we can normalize it and make it more comfortable for people to just talk about it honestly it seems like humor becomes woven into these discussions no matter what we do anyway so it seems like um i don't know if you're finding that but it seems like there's kind of a natural type of humor we have when we start talking in these in these deeper ways about what's real and true about life it ends up leading us there one way or another to to, to end up laughing together and sharing joy together well karen I am so touched by that story of your mom of your mom and her brother. Like I can't to think that they had each other to go through the hospice experience to kind of to walk that path together and die within a day of each other. I don't believe that's coincidence. I think they were walking each other home. And um, 
it's it almost makes me tear up just thinking about how how special that really was um so thank you for sharing that and then um but going to humor um you know my work with people both in the er and hospice setting has has just shown me time and time again that there is humor to be found in every situation i mean uh you may not always find humor in every situation but but when you find yourself doing things you never thought you would do there's a you know I, oh i never thought i'd be changing my dad's depends i i never thought i would be you know needing to um track down my dad who left the house because he has dementia i mean there's so many moments of the audacity of the situation where people just find lightness and humor in it because what else can you do um but also i think i mean it's such a healthy coping mechanism as long as we're continuing to also talk about what's really happening and not just deflecting with humor and um but i see it every day with hospice families and i i actually use humor as a tool when i'm working with patients and families um to to help deliver information to help normalize the situation to introduce that there can be life and laughter in the midst of um a dying process um and my family i grew up with similar to your conversation about what your mom your mom and your brother back and forth my dad was always talking still talks about you know you're out of the will now because you didn't <laughs> do this you're regularly just discussing death in a humorous and matter of fact way uh which i think helped propel me into this path for sure um, yeah and yeah. i think that's the the beauty of the death deck using it as you said before anyone is is seriously ill before you're facing that you can begin with a little bit lighter subject matter to talk about and bring the humor in from the beginning which just eases you into looking at some hard and and difficult things but with a little bit more lighthearted approach to them yes exactly well said karen <laughs> Well, I'm excited to see about your new deck. So possibly with the new year, the EOL deck will be out and then any idea of the other one, or I guess that's still, that's a work in progress. So that is one at a time, <laughs> one at a time. because you, it's not Hopefully like this is the three. only thing. <laughs> yeah. It's not like this is the only thing you two are doing. You both have very busy lives <laughs> with children and jobs and creative work you're doing. So, but I'm so appreciative that you have created these decks for everyone to use and that they're out there as tools. So tell listeners where they can get a hold of the death deck. Yeah. Well, we have a website, thedeathdeck.com. And you can read our blog as well and find out uh, anything and everything more about Lisa and I. You can sign up for a newsletter, which will alert you to when the EOL deck will be coming out. Uh, the death deck is also sold on Amazon. And we are on social media channels at the death deck. And I discovered on your website that you sell merch also, so people can get death deck hats and shirts and all kinds of things on your website, Coffee which mug. are really fun. Coffee yeah. mugs. Yeah. Really yeah. fun. And we do have some upcoming events, um, oh, yeah. uh, both in person and online. Uh, we have a death deck game night in LA next uh, Wednesday in person. Very excited to be doing in person events again. So um, if you follow us um, at the death deck, especially our Instagram, uh, we, we're we always updating with all of the events in the area and online that people can participate in. We have a, um, we've partnered with another woman uh, who goes by death project manager. Uh, she's created a tool book and um, we've been hosting um, silent book clubs, death edition, which has been just 
as an avid book reader, I, I'm treasuring this time together where we get we get together in a brewery and everyone reads a select book that, of their choice on the topic of death and dying. And then we, we socialize afterwards. And um, it's, it's a rich and a fun group of people. We welcome all new people. So if anyone's interested, yeah, follow us on Instagram. Oh, I love that. I lo <clears throat> love, excuse me. <clears throat> love the idea of the silent book club i think that's that would be really fun um because i'm i love to read also but i want to read what i want to read <laughs> not what somebody <laughs> else suggests i read so i would love that well um it, lisa and Lori, it's been so much fun to talk with both of you once again about the death deck so thank you for joining me here thank you for having us karen it's been great yeah, well, I can't wait to just stay in touch and catch up the next time and see what what else you're up to. So meanwhile, take care and and good luck with everything. Thank you, Karen. Always a pleasure. Yeah. All right. Same same here. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Lisa Paul and Lori Losistero, who created the Death Deck. I always love talking to those two. And I'm really excited to hear about the new projects they're working on, and I can't wait till those are available. So if you're not familiar with the Death Deck, be sure and check it out. And stay tuned next week for another new interview. Until then, thanks for all your support. Thanks for remembering to subscribe down below and subscribing and leaving a rating and review for the podcast.